So hi, hi everyone. Uh, this is um, this is the state of open source licensing talk. Uh, this will be in English, not in French, unfortunately. I, I think it would probably be better in French, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so uh, just a little bit about me. I'm a uh, I'm a lawyer at Red Hat. I've uh, mostly worked at Red Hat for the past uh, eight years, uh, with a little interlude in between when I was at um, HP. And uh, I, I'm one of the lawyers who specializes in open source. Uh, it's very important for Red Hat, obviously. It's uh, something I've been specializing in really for the past 10 years. So, um, so th this talk is, it, it, it's in a kind of a collection of topics that uh, you know I think of as having been relevant in the past five, six years when I think about what are the interesting legal issues going on around um, open source licensing. And because I, I framed it as open source licensing, there are some issues that, that are kind of interesting and are, are sort of going on that, um, that are kind of legal in nature and have to do with open source, but they don't really have to do with licensing and I can't really uh, easily argue that they do. So, so I'm not going to really address um, certain kinds of issues of that, that sort. So uh, this is the, I came up with a set of, of topics. They, they, you could argue that they all have something in common and I think what they have, well some of them have something in common and I think what, what that is is the um, open source has, as it's matured, uh, it's the uh, role of corporations, companies, uh, you know, and especially big businesses has increased. I think open source and free software started out as more of a, uh, an individual developer grassroots kind of um, cultural phenomenon and it became embraced by business which was very uh, you know important thing but that's had a uh, some interesting transformative effects on uh, you know legal issues around open source so um, I don't know if these are issues that interest any of you and, and if anyone wants to if we have time to talk about other issues or if, or if you want to talk about other things I'm totally okay with that um, but this is what I'll plan on doing so um, the 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 first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, this is you know for for lawyers dealing with open source this is the the most interesting topic the decline of copyleft um, so and copyleft is the the policy behind the GPL um, I'm going to kind of assume a certain level of background knowledge in in open source licensing um, you know I think probably a lot of you are developers and you have some knowledge of even if you don't think of yourselves as open source developers you have some knowledge of the basic landscape of open source licensing um, the, the the GPL historically um, was really the, it kind of loomed large as, as a, such an influential open source license and copyleft was the name given to the, the basic policy behind the GPL, which is basically to, to make sure that improvements to a program um, remain free or open source. Uh, so, you know, there, there's always been this, this um, debate in the developer community between you know, the, it used to be characterized as the GPL side versus the BSD side. So you're probably familiar with the BSD license as being kind of the polar opposite type of license, kind of like the MIT license. It's very simple. It says basically you can do whatever you want. The GPL is much more complex and, and more restrictive. And those are kind of the two polar uh, extremes in, in open source licensing. And then you have licenses that are kind of in, in the middle and, and adopt a kind of compromise policy like uh, the LGPL or the, the Eclipse license, for example. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's, there's always been this policy debate, um, but, but for much of that time, uh, you know, we're talking about a few decades now that this has been going on, uh, the, the, there wasn't really a, a sense that, um, I mean, if there was a sense that one license was dominant, it was the GPL. And, and uh, we don't actually, the interesting thing is we don't actually know very much about about the the data behind license popularity and license trends. The 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 issue here is that 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 uh, in in the past five years there's been this meme uh, in in the open source world that the GPL is in decline, and in favor of more permissive licenses like the MIT license or the Apache license. And so so we we don't really know if that's true because we don't have good data. We don't have good ways of analyzing data. You know it, we. When, when companies or, or people purport to try to analyze this stuff as, as, you know, there are some companies that do that, like Black Duck, uh, 
for example, there are, there are people who have tried to do this. It's not really clear how do you, how do you actually compare one project with another, you know, projects vary in their importance and in their size and in, in their significance to particular ecosystems. Um, another issue that makes it hard to, to, to analyze this, this sort of thing is um, it's actually hard to kind of pin down what the license is for a given uh, project. It's, um, we, we kind of like to think that, oh, this project is under GPL, this project is under LGPL, this project is under the Apache license. It's actually much more complex when you get um, into the details. And, and you, know, you might have some parts of a code base that are under one license versus another. And so, so it's not actually clear how you even label what the license of a project is. We, um, we, we do know how this meme started, uh, pretty much. There was a guy named Matthew Aslett, who was a tech analyst um, at, at, um, the, at the time, at least, the 451 group. I'm not sure if he's still there. And he wrote a, a blog post in uh, t yeah, 2011 where he, s he purported to analyze um, data that was, I think, provided by Black Duck on license trends and, and maybe some other data. And he, he concluded that there was evidence of a, uh, a significant decline in um, use of the GPL, uh, a rise in the use of um, permissive open source licenses like the Apache license, particularly among, um, among corporate participants in open source projects. Um, I think he, he noted a decline in uh, you, you know, projects that are dominated by a single company and a rise in projects being multi-company uh, collaborative endeavors. And, and you know, I think there's, there's some, some truth to this. I think he was spotting some, some real trends. It's not, it's not really clear whether his, his conclusion about license popularity um, was correct because we don't really know if the data is good. You know, this is not, um, this is, this is proprietary, proprietary data sets. Uh, nonetheless, the, the interesting story is that the meme uh, took hold and, and, and to the point where you can't, it's really hard to argue that, that it's wrong. Um, I, on some level, I feel that it's correct because it matches things that I've seen in my work and in ways I've thought about things. But, but you know, on some level, I, don't, I just don't know what, what the truth is. Um, one of the interesting effects is that advocates of the GPL, you know, sometimes uh, the, the, some of the strongest advocates for a particular, uh, you know, kind of licensing ideology in open source were put on the defensive because they didn't really know how to how to respond to this this claim that the GPL was in decline. Uh, you know, m many people were, were eager to to believe that this was a real trend, and, and I include myself in that on, on some level, even though I'm I, I'm certainly supportive of, of the use of the GPL for many. Uh, projects, uh, many, many projects coming out of Red Hat use the GPL and, and, and always have. Um, I was actually, in, in my work, I was very welcoming of uh, more of a diverse approach to open source licensing. So I thought this is a, this is a good development maybe because we have more, you know, less of a kind of monolithic approach to, uh, or, or ideological approach to open source licensing. Um, you know, I, I think my, my view is that, that it's not necessarily that there's a decline going on, but rather, you had the GPL getting dominant in the 1990s in the, the Unix and Linux ecosystem. You know, I had all this um, free software and open source software designed originally for Unix, and then you had Linux, and it was very much a GPL-dominated ecosystem. Um, a lot of that, I think, had to do with the, just the influence of the Linux kernel project. And what I think happened is as open source got um, extended to other parts of the software stack and other language communities and so forth, um, the popularity of the GPL didn't extend to those other areas. So it's not, not so much a decline, I think, but a, a failure to extend influence in, as open source expanded its, its general influence beyond um, Unix and Linux. Um, so, so what some people, uh, basically GPL advocates, said about this is, is kind of interesting. I think it's actually more interesting than, than whether the trend is correct or not. Um, some people said, well, this is a, you know, th there's a younger generation, they didn't grow up using Linux, they're, they're all using Macs, and, and uh, uh, you know, they, they're, they're web developers, and they just didn't, they didn't grow up with the influence of this kind of older generation of, the, of uh, open source and free software developers who, who prefer GPL licensing. Um, certainly, it's, it's plausible. Um, Chris Weber, uh, a friend of mine who's talked about this, he, he also saw this as a kind of web development phenomenon, if, it, if, it's real, if it's a real phenomenon at all. 
And he, he, he said, you know, when you look at, at web development, what you see actually is a retreat from open source licensing. So in the days when open source free software was primarily, you know, at lower levels of the operating system stack, uh, you actually had GPL being used with like really big programs and application programs, uh, demons and so forth. Uh, in, in web development, what you have is l a real um, large amount of tools and libraries and frameworks that are open source, but web applications themselves tend to be proprietary. They tend to be, uh, you know, trade secret. You don't, you don't get the source code for for big web applications normally, and then they're not under an open source license. So, so that's that's kind of his sort of pessimistic view. But he also blames copyleft uh, GPL advocates for for uh, he says being asleep at the wheel, meaning uh, they they haven't really tried to um, advocate for use of the GPL uh, in, in, as open source has you know kind of attracted the attention of a younger generation. Um, another thing that he's pointed out is, which I think is correct, is that role models play an important part in what license developers use for their projects. So this probably explains why the GPL originally got very popular. And, uh, you know, Linus Torvalds was, was a role model and many people wanted to emulate his, his licensing preferences, so they used the GPL for their projects. In, uh, in other communities, uh, you know, you, you have role models, you know, prominent developers using the Apache license um, or, or the MIT license. And so those licenses, other licenses than the GPL will dominate those particular language and framework communities. So I think that's, that, that makes sense. I, I also think that um, some of it, I mean, I have no proof of this, but, but some of it is probably due to a, a backlash among developers which began around 2009, 2010 against the use of um, the, the, the business model that's known as open core. It's a variant of the old dual licensing business model where you have a usually GPL licensed community version of a project and sometimes a feature enhanced proprietary version of a, of a product. Uh, once a pretty influential open source business model, um, one that Red Hat really hasn't used pretty much at, at all. But uh, this became very un unpopular and was widely criticized. And I think it, it, um, it uh, damaged the reputation of, of the GPL. And it, I think it may have played some role in, in a, a, a disinclination of developers to use the GPL. Uh, another thing is, that, that I, as you know, I mentioned the, the increasing role of companies. As originally, um, the way open source got into companies is kind of surreptitiously, uh, and, and you know, developers would kind of start using you know software that was open source. So this is how Linux kind of got a foothold in the enterprise, and they wouldn't they, they wouldn't ask for permission. They just do it, and then eventually, it, it really took hold. And um, I think what happened is you know companies as they became accustomed to, to open source software, they started to institute policies around it and they realized that, well, you know, they, 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 they had a lot of concern about the GPL historically. It's a relatively restrictive license. There was a lot of, there was always a lot of FUD or uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt around the GPL. And they realized they could live with the more permissive licenses more easily. And so I think that, that companies, you know, business people got more influential over the choices made by uh, developers. So, so that's the that's the first first topic. The, this, the, so, so um, POS is post open source software. It's not just the um, Paris Open Source Summit. Uh, so, so when um, that conference was named Paris Open Source Summit, a lot of us chuckled because because in the past few years there's been this um, another meme kind of related to the decline of the GPL meme that that we're now living in this era of post open source software, uh, and and what it basically means is. Um, um, it, it refers to the f this supposed phenomenon of developers not wanting to license uh, their software at all, or at least to explicitly license their software, kind of associated with, with uh, GitHub. This, this, we also know how this meme started. Uh, James Governor, the analyst with um, Redmonk, uh, posted this, this famous tweet, um, yeah, 2012, so, so not so long ago. Where he, he, you know, he talks about this this younger generation on GitHub that just doesn't care about licensing, or or governance. Doesn't not really clear what he means by governance there, but but this this really attracted a lot of attention, and there was a lot of um, anger at the time towards GitHub from some uh, some quarters. I think I think there were um, there were people who were associated with some of the old line open source foundations like Apache and Eclipse who saw the rising popularity of GitHub as a um, 
as a threat to them, and and so th there was a, this inclination to be uh, to, to to view GitHub as 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 being the source of a lot of problems that were going on in open source, and so they kind of seized on this idea that you know why can't GitHub do something about this problem, this this horrible problem that you have all these repositories on GitHub that should be open source, but they're not open source because there's no license. Uh, so, so, and, and you know, so some people responded to this. Um, you know, the, the, there are many people who, said, who insisted, you know, all this software is unsafe to use because it's, you know, if you don't have a, an explicit license, it's not open source. It's you have to assume it's proprietary software. Uh, you have no rights to use it. Some people said that, uh, you know, some lawyers said, you know, why would developers? Do this? Why wouldn't they use a license? If you if you have no license on your software, you know companies are never going to adopt your software. If they if they find your software in, you know if they acquire a company and they're using your software, they're just going to rip it out. And and you know th there's there's some truth to that. Um, but I think the the reaction against this was you know a, a kind of a little bit overdone. Um, GitHub itself said. You know, in a way, they weren't very helpful at first about this. They said, you know, well, developers have a right not to put a license on their on their code. You know, so GitHub was under pressure to um, change its terms of use to require developers by default to use an open source license, and they didn't they didn't want to do this. They do have in their terms of service um, today, and uh, they did back then, that you know, by, if you have a public repository, you're allowing you're giving permission to everyone else to fork the repository, but that's not, a, that's not the same thing as giving an actual open source license grant. So you, you, you might ask, and, or at least I've, I've asked, you know, is there an argument that, that uh, a, a, a repository on GitHub that has no explicit license is implicitly licensed? I think implicit um, licensing is, is, a, is a powerful concept, and it, it exists in, in United States law, and uh, I'm sure it exists in some form in, in French law and so forth. And uh, the problem is that um, implied licensing doesn't really go far enough. So, so if you put code on GitHub, yes, you're, even without those terms of service, you're probably giving an implied permission to everyone to uh, you know, use your software for development purposes. But, but open source is really much uh, broader than that. Open source uh, implies the right to, or requires the right to commercialize software, and there's no reason to assume necessarily that any arbitrary GitHub repository comes with an implied, uh, uh, you know, promise not to sue someone later on if they use your software commercially. So that's that's kind of the problem there. Uh, the probably the most the most intelligent response to this this whole phenomenon was by my friend uh, Louis uh, Villa, who wrote this blog post um, pushing back against licensing and the, the permission culture. So, so I think he, he was correct in, in noticing something that you know, um, in studies that have been done on, on uh, GitHub repositories that do have a license, uh, by far the MIT license, one of the most simple, permissive, most permissive open source licenses, is the most popular. That may have something to do with the Ruby on Rails origins of GitHub, um, uh, you know, MIT license is very popular in that community. But, but it may also be the sign of a, a, a trend, uh, you know, this is why it's related to the previous topic, uh, among the developers who were originally kind of drawn to GitHub. And, and there has also been this interest in recent years in, in um, among developers in using very permissive licenses, um, licenses that really amount to grants of, um, uh, to put the software in the public domain, so there's there's the Creative Commons CC0 uh, instrument, and there's uh, this thing called the Unlicense, which is actually pretty popular on GitHub. So maybe this is all part of a trend where developers um, actually really are reacting against the whole idea that you have to explicitly give permission in order to share software. They they want to share software. They don't want to. It's they're not. Uh, omitting licenses because they don't want to share software. It's quite the contrary. They don't think they should have to do anything special in order to share software. They think that the default situation should be that software is shareable. And the problem with that is that it doesn't quite fit in with the, the formalities of the legal system. That, you know, the, the most you have, as I, as I was saying before, is, is maybe some limited implicit licensing. So it's, it's kind of, he kind of said that it's a missed opportunity for engaging in, in uh, copyright reform. Um, so GitHub actually did respond to all the pressure they got over this issue. They, um, so, so now um, when you um, create a new project on GitHub, 
at least under some circumstances, you're given this easy opportunity to um, initially populate the repository with, a, with a, an open source license if you want to. It gives you a choice of several, um, it's not all possible open source licenses. And GitHub also set up this educational website called choosealicense.com, which uh, I, I initially criticized. Um, this is, yeah, this is how it's, uh, this is how it looks today. So they, they responded to some, some criticisms that some of us had, but um, you, you know, it was well intended. They, they, they wanted, they, they felt the problem was a problem of education and that if developers um, just learn more about licenses, they would uh, be more likely to put licenses uh, on their code if they wanted to. Um, the pro so, so GitHub actually found later on that, that um, you know, when they set up the website initially, there was a, there, there was an uptick in, in repositories that were explicitly licensed, and then it kind of dropped down again. And they had, and it, you know, according to their their analysis, there actually was a fairly low percentage of repositories on on GitHub that had an explicit license. They, they later on um, uh, did some some research and and found that actually they were probably too pessimistic the first time around. So it turns out that that um, a lot of uh, repositories on GitHub, a lot of projects on GitHub do have an explicit license. It's just not um, so obvious. So it might be stated in a very informal way in uh, you know, like the, f the packaging metadata for a given uh, language or whatever, it, it, they, but there's no, let's say there's no license file. So that's actually a pretty common thing. And so people who have tried to look for whether a, a repository is licensed or not would look for uh, whether there's a top level license file and not all developers do that. You know, maybe they should do it as a, as a best practice, but it's actually pretty common not to do that. Um, another thing that I think I, I may have been the first person to call attention to is that there's actually a really nice thing about GitHub in that, uh, you know, if, if you find a repository that's, that's not licensed, you can do a pull request or file an, an issue. And, um, you know, very often that's going to be successful in getting the maintainer of the project to to include a license, and it actually, for the first time in probably open source history, gives uh, you know people other than the main developers of a project a lot of influence over um, license selection. So you have th this is a, a actually a um, pull request uh, or issue that that I myself uh, filed because because th there was a a group at Red, uh, actually a product group at Red Hat that wanted to use some software, and it turned out it didn't have any explicit license and. Uh, uh, so you know, I just said, you know, can you can you please put a copy of the Apache license in in this repository? And the, and the guy said, yes, uh, thank you. And and that's actually um, a lot of people have had this experience. So so I actually think that this is um, you know far from being a bad thing, it's actually maybe a a, a positive development in some respects. So probably an, an overblown issue, but nonetheless one that uh, that attracted a lot of attention. And I think there's there's actually still quite a bit of this anger I see towards GitHub. I was just at a, a, another conference recently where a guy from GitHub gave a talk about this kind of topic, and, and there were some really kind of angry people in the audience. And so it's just kind of interesting that, that, that GitHub attracts that kind of uh, uh, emotion from certain types of people. Uh, so, so next topic, uh, this is contributor agreements. Um, this, is a t this is a topic, I've, I've given talks on this topic, and uh, people can accuse me of being uh, sort of obsessed with it. Uh, so, so, just a little bit of background. Um, maybe you're familiar with CLAs, contributor license agreements, or copyright assignments. Uh, some some projects will require you to sign an agreement in order to make a contribution, uh, and those are two common approaches. You know, a copyright assignment is you know you transfer your copyright over to the the company or the developer or the foundation that kind of controls the project. Um, contributor license agreement typically involves you somewhat similar. You're not transferring ownership, but you're granting a very broad license to the entity that controls the project. Um, this is not what most projects do. Most projects, uh, you know, historically and even today, um, the vast majority of projects just assume that um, contributors are, are contributing code to the project under the same license as the outbound license of the project. If it's an Apache license project, your patch or your contribution is under the Apache license. If it's a GPL license project, it's under the GPL. And this isn't always handled explicitly, admittedly, but in some projects it actually is quite explicitly noted in documentation. There's this alternative approach called the DCO, which you, you may have heard of, maybe not, because it's kind of common in the, the Linux ecosystem mostly. But in, in this approach, you, you're, um, the assumption is that your patch, your contribution is under the license of the project, but when you, um, 
when you submit your patch, uh, you include this statement signed off by and then your name and email address. And that references a, a certification that is very simple and it says, you know, I had the right to, I wrote this myself, I had the right to contribute it under this, the license of the project, um, or someone else gave it to me, someone else wrote it, and I believe I had the right to submit it under the license, the open source license of the project. It's, it's um, very nice, very, very kind of elegant and simple. And um, the approach taken by a growing number of, of projects. So uh, that's kind of the background to that issue. The, um, the, the, the contra there, there's always been controversy over this issue, really going back many, many years. Um, the, the recent phase of the controversy was associated with Canonical and um, Ubuntu. So, so in 2009, I don't know when this actually started, but in 2009, uh, 2010, uh, Canonical attracted a, a lot of attention for um, requiring contributors to upstart, which was one of its prominent projects at the time, uh, to sign a copyright assignment agreement. And uh, th this just kind of opened up uh, these really old um, historical wounds and controversies over, over copyright assignment, which at least in the Linux world is very unpopular among developers. And uh, that's kind of what, what I think started this, this new wave of of political dispute over this issue of contributor agreements. Um, there, are, there are a lot of uh, policy arguments that, that have been raised over the years against, um, you know, primarily now CLAs, but also copyright assignment historically. Um, and, and they were kind of repeated in this, you know, post-2009 uh, period. The, the one that I think may have been new uh, uh, in, in this period was th this, argument that you know what's what's wrong with these agreements is that they are asymmetrical they, they give they give the uh, company or, or whoever it is who's in control of the project too much power they, they uh, this was often you know at, at, the, at, at this early phase of, of this this uh, this new wave of political dispute over contributor agreements the, typically the outbound license was the GPL uh, or you know relatively restrictive open source license and um, the argument was that you know, the, the, on, if you use an agreement like this, the, the you know, company like Canonical has the right to license the software under a proprietary license, a commercial closed source license, but no one else has that that right. Whereas you know, with with non copyleft permissive licensing like the MIT license or the Apache license, the, you know, the, the what what that has in its favor is that there's there's a, a a symmetrical treatment of, of licensing power among all participants. So, so anyone um, anyone can proprietize a project, not just one privileged entity. And, and this was this was voiced by many um, many critics of, of these agreements. There there are others other um, arguments as well. Uh, you, you, you know the, these are the, these agreements. They're always criticized for adding a lot of red tape. Um, in recent years, companies have actually made some effort to automate these this process but but there's the, the argument that uh, that that just having these agreements inhibits um, your ab ability to, to develop to uh, grow a community around your project uh, it, it something that I pointed out um, at one time was that it kind of implies that there's something insufficient legally about open source licensing that that you know open source licensing is good enough for the project for the outbound project that you're giving users but for some reason it's not considered good enough for contributors and you know no one no one quite explains why should there be that kind of difference in in treatment it implies that the, you know there's something wrong with the open source license if you can't use it as the license of the contribution uh, you know, it, these, these agreements uh, involve risk being placed on the contributor, and you might say that that's justified, and that, uh, you know, I, I, I think this is one of the problems of these agreements, because again, it's, it's uh, they're asymmetrical. So, so I, 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 as you can kind of tell, maybe, I, I kind of got uh, involved in this issue personally, and, and, and I have pretty strong opinions about it, but, but the, it, it's been one of the dominant uh, political issues in open source licensing for the past several years. Um, so what's happened recently, um, so, so Canonical, when Canonical was faced with all of this criticism over its copyright assignment agreement, it, uh, it attempted to get a lot of companies and developers together to draft this like one uniform model set of contributor agreements because they thought that, well, you know, this, uh, you know, if everyone could kind of agree on this, we'd get support for this approach. And, and actually this was a total failure, which I think is, is interesting. And, and, and you know there there wasn't interest in in developing a, a a uniform system of contributor agreements. Uh, 
uh, we, we don't really see copyright assignment anymore for various reasons. I think companies kind of caught on to the fact that, that this is just very unpopular among developers. They don't like the idea of giving up ownership of what they write. And so they've kind of used CLAs as an alternative. As I kind of said, the CLAs are, are basically very similar in policy, but there is this one difference that you're not transferring ownership. You're granting a very broad license instead. So, uh, you know, we've actually seen uh, in recent years, as far as I can tell, maybe not an increase in use of CLAs, but as, as companies have gotten more involved in open source development, I see a lot of them using CLAs. So I, maybe I should explain that, that at Red Hat, we have typically not used CLAs for our projects, um, with some exceptions that are mostly historical in nature. Uh, so that's kind of a, you know the bias that I'm I'm kind of taking on, on this that that this isn't a, an approach that we use and and and, and so I see this the, the other companies using these agreements and and I think they they don't really justify the practice I think a lot of it is is what I think of as cargo cult lawyering they they do it because they see their colleagues doing it and and they haven't really thought about whether it's actually necessary or provides any real uh, value. Um, I mentioned the, the DCO, and, and I think the, the, the issue has sort of been shaped up as being one of, uh, you know, do you use the DCO or the CLAs? Because uh, the, the, it's hard to argue, for, for someone who wants to use a CLA, for a company that wants to use a CLA, it's hard to argue that you should just not use anything at all. But the DCO is kind of a, a nice alternative in the sense that it looks like, uh, it, it, it kind of looks appealing to a, to a lawyer in the sense because it looks like someone's making a certification. They, they are making a certification and there's a kind of formality to it superficially that appeals to some of the, um, you know, typically lawyers who think that CLAs are a good thing. So um, in, in the OpenStack project, uh, the, this issue kind of became uh, heated for a while and, and OpenStack uh, reached a compromise where they, uh, they, they allowed the DCO for individual contributions but continued to use CLAs for corporate contributions. So that's, that's that issue. Uh, so I said I would also talk about uh, open source licenses and software patents. I, th there isn't that much to say about this issue. Um, th there, there was a lot of interest for a while in the earlier 2000s in seeing if open source licenses could be uh, used in some way to address the software patent problem. And, and so it became common uh, around 2000, you know, after the, uh, in the years after that, to, to expect that new open source licenses would have um, a, an explicit patent license grant. That this is something that GPL version 2 did not quite have. Uh, so the, the, the GPL v3, which is the, the update to the GPL that was released in 2007, had a very kind of um, comprehensive approach to the software patent issue. And, and I think for a while it looked like that would be the, um, the, the dominant approach going forward with open source licenses, that you'd see a very ambitious attempt to use open source licenses to do something about the software patent issue. And I think what what happened w was something a little bit different. Um, I th th there's this recognition now that, that um, explicit patent license grants of the sort that you see in the Apache license, for example, are, are valuable things, but I don't think there's that much interest in doing uh, more than that. Uh, I, I think this is something that developers, uh, I, so developers tend not to like software patents, but I think that, that th th this issue, in, in some ways developers were more, um, uh, fired up over this issue 10 years ago than I think they are now. I think this is, in some ways, maybe it's because uh, there have been some court developments, judicial developments in the United States, which is the where the, you know, in a sense, the worst software patent problem uh, has existed, that have uh, reduced some of the uh, some of the scope of software patent software patentability. Um, maybe it's just that developers just aren't as interested in this issue as they were 10 years ago. Um, so it, 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 there doesn't some, seem to be much interest in using open source licenses to address this issue uh, uh, beyond um, you know, seeing it generally being valuable to have an explicit patent license grant. So some people will say you know, it's be better to use the Apache license than the MIT license because the Apache license addresses patents explicitly. There's actually, you, know, you can actually debate whether that's true because you can argue that the, whatever effect uh, the MIT license has on patents implicitly is broader than what you get in the Apache license. But, but that's kind of been how the issue has been looked at. Uh, 
Ah, so 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 another development in this area is that that uh, some companies have taken the approach of uh, taking the simple permissive licenses like the MIT license or the BSD license and tacking on uh, patent license grants. So, so Google, I think, was the first to do this with the WebM codec project. So it has the BSD license, and then in, in a separate file, there's a patent license grant. And uh, Microsoft did something a little bit like this with uh, Core CLR. Uh, a, a lawyer from Oracle got a license uh, approved by the Open Source Initiative last year that is based on the MIT license but has an explicit patent license grant. And there's a lawyer at Intel who's doing something a little bit like this with the BSD license. So he's a proposed uh, the BSD license with an Apache license style patent license grant. And the, the uh, you know, you might ask why, why not just use the Apache license, which is pretty popular. I think it's because uh, the Apache license is perceived as being incompatible with GPL version two. Um, whether I agree with that is kind of a, another issue, but the, the Apache license is also relatively complex for a permissive license, and there's a lot of interest in, in using simpler licenses than even the Apache license. So I think that's why that's, that's gone on. Uh, last topic I wanted to talk about. So I don't know if this, this is really of interest to, to, um, to you all. The, the, to lawyers involved in, in open source licensing, this is a pretty big issue, the issue of um, enforcement of of the GPL, uh, you know, we don't um, we don't see very much uh, judicial treatment of open source licenses. It's one of the interesting things about this this field, and and we don't have much guidance from the legal system about how to interpret open source licenses. Uh, there's some good things about that because it kind of allows us to make up the rules as we go along, and I think that there's something very powerful about that. The the, the problem with it is that there isn't. Uh, you know, there isn't a kind of a consensus about, uh, you know, how to interpret various things in open source licenses uh, uniformly. And if we had guidance from courts and so forth, we might have uh, more agreement on how to interpret, um, you know, various open source licenses. So, so there's different views on that, that whole issue. Um, the, 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 the license that has most associated with enforcement, of course, is the, the GPL or the GPL family, it's because the GPL is the most restrictive license and it's the license that, the, the mainstream license that tries to do the most in, in terms of policy. And so the, and the license I would say that, that, you know, users of the license are maybe most passionate about in terms of, um, you know, getting upset if, if downstream commercial entities are not complying with the license. So, so there's reasons why this is a, a GPL specific uh, sort of issue. So, so historically, you know, there was enforcement of the GPL in, the, in a community sense. Initially, um, if you uh, are old enough to remember Usenet, uh, there, there was, uh, you know, GPL enforcement was done on Usenet, on, on these public news groups. Uh, you would have people, you know, developers and others applying pressure to companies that were seen as violating the GPL. And, and you know, violating the GPL, uh, you know, usually means or, or would mean, you know, just simply not providing source code. The license says you have to provide source code if you distribute the software, and these are, you know, many companies would provide, uh, in some cases, modified versions of GPL software in binary form without providing source code and, and actually licensed under a proprietary license. So that's kind of the nature of the typical uh, violation. Um, but it was seen as something that was, you know, kind of in the hands of the community until fairly recently. So there's this percep perception in the past few years, um, at least among lawyers, that that there's been uh, a change in this area. So, so there have been a, a few cases in the U.S. and um, actually there was a case in Germany as well, maybe some other con uh, countries, where the entity bringing uh, a GPL uh, in compliance lawsuit has been a, a company rather than a project or a developer. Uh, and, and this is seen as a, you know, some people see this as a, as a worrisome trend because these are, uh, you know, unlike the, the situation in the past, these companies are not really focused on, um, you know, getting compliance, but actually, uh, you know, getting, uh, they, they may have commercial goals in bringing a lawsuit. And so there's, there's some concern about that, even though there's some value in possibly getting guidance from the courts on how to interpret the license. There's also been this perception of an escalation in community enforcement of the GPL, and I think that that's, um, it's, it's pretty debatable because there's so little community enforcement of the GPL. But there is 
There is one group that has been um, in recent years enforcing the GPL actively in a kind of in the name of the community or in the name of um, community developers, and that's the Software Freedom Conservancy. Uh, and the, the Conservancy started a, a project of sorts to um, help Linux kernel developers, individual Linux kernel developers, uh, enforce their, their copyrights on the Linux kernel. And uh, last year they announced that they were funding a, a lawsuit in Germany uh, brought by uh, Christoph Helwig, who's a famous Linux kernel developer, against VMware. And this is a, this is a, a groundbreaking, potentially groundbreaking lawsuit because for the first time, it, it raises the issue of um, the derivative works requirement in the GPL. So the, the GPL says, um, you know, you don't, it doesn't just simply say you have to provide source code, and it, it says that if you modify the software, if you create a, a, a larger work, uh, you know, a, a derived work of the original software, uh, under some conditions you have to license that whole modified version under the GPL. And so there's always been this debate over what the scope of that requirement is. And, and advocates of the GPL tend to believe it's a broad requirement rather than a very narrow requirement. And so this, this lawsuit is um, raising this issue. It involves the, um, um, the, the hypervisor in the vSphere product, which uh, makes use of a lot of uh, drivers from the Linux kernel. So the issue is, you know, the, the, you have these GPL license drivers and this GPL license uh, compatibility layer and a proprietary kernel. And um, Christoph Helwig is arguing that whole thing ought to be under the GPL. VMware has, is arguing that, uh, no, that that compatibility layer is basically defining a, 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 an API that cleanly separates two pieces that should be considered separate and independent. So, so if we do, um, if, we, if, if this does actually come to a court decision, it may provide some, some pretty groundbreaking uh, guidance on how to interpret the GPL. Uh, then again, it, it, it's, it, maybe it'll be only relevant for Germany, and I don't know how much guidance it actually will, will provide. And so we, we don't know very much about this, this lawsuit because um, German court procedure is uh, highly confidential. Um, the reason why, uh, there, there actually been a lot of GPL compliance lawsuits brought in Germany, and that's because uh, Germany is very favorable to copyright infringement lawsuits. You get a very, very quick kind of procedure for resolving your uh, lawsuit. So there's, uh, there's this other thing going on, which I, people are not really willing to talk about uh, very much, and I will just, I, I, I quote um, really the only public acknowledgement of it that I've, I've found, which is on the, the website LWN, which is that there, there's, there's rumors about this one Linux kernel developer who uh, has been filing lawsuits in Germany. So this is a different developer from uh, Christoph Helwig, but, but also a Linux kernel developer apparently filing a lot of lawsuits you know, using kind of um, abusive tactics. Um, again, we don't know very much about the facts. This is all kind of at the level of rumor. But um, th there, there are certainly companies uh, that, are, that are worried about this. Um, the, the Linux Foundation, which is a consortium of, of uh, mostly companies involved in Linux and other open source projects, is very, very concerned about uh, th these lawsuits uh, deterring comp conservative companies, like for example the autom automotive industry in Germany, from um, from using Linux-based uh, infotainment systems and so forth. So, so there's a lot of concern about this uh, uh, this activity in Germany, and, and it's kind of getting conflated with the 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 Christoph Helwig lawsuit. And and in response to that, the the Free Software Foundation and the Software Freedom Conservancy last year published this statement of um, you know what are the principles of uh, community-oriented GPL enforcement, kind of designed to, just to separate themselves from the tactics of this, this uh, rumored uh, developer who's bringing those, those abusive lawsuits in Germany. Uh, so I don't know if there's time for questions, but that, that was the, those were the topics I, I wanted to talk about. Um, we have one minute, uh, so if anyone has questions. Yeah, so so actually, that's a that's a really good point. Uh, that that's probably relevant to the issue of the possible decline of the GPL because in uh, you know in, in the the compliance issue in traditional GPL enforcement is you know you're distributing a binary to someone else uh, 
and you don't comply with the source code requirement. And the GPL is triggered by distribution, and when you have software as a service, you basically don't have distribution, or at least that's how the, the GPL is generally interpreted. So, so the argument is that in the cloud, in, in, you know, in the web context, uh, GPL is no different from the BSD license or the MIT license. And so why, why bother to use a GPL if the effect is really just going to be the same if you use a simpler license? So I think that's probably, that probably is, um, has played a part in whatever has possibly gone on in that, that issue of um, trends and choice of open source licenses. Yeah. Contribute, so contributors to open source projects based on the contribution they make. No, no, I have not. I have not heard of anything. You know, what, so th there's been. You know, there is this kind of fear that uh, so the, going to the CLA issue. There's this fear that that. Uh, you know, someone might contribute to a project, but then they might later on say, uh, oh, I didn't intend to contribute this code. I want to, you, you have no right to use it. And has that ever happened? You know, I, I, I think I have heard about things like that happening, you know, maybe once or twice over the past uh, 15 or 20 years. Um, and, and usually when, in the cases I know about, what happens is the developer who tries to do that then backs down because there's been so much criticism of that, you know, and, and probably the developer, you know, I, I would say the developer has who who wants to revoke an open source license uh, ha doesn't have a legal, you know, basis for for doing that. Um, so uh, I, you know, you know, certainly I have not heard of anything beyond that. Um, I think there's also concern about about patents. Uh, so contributor to a project later on suing the some downstream user of the code for patent infringement. Uh, you, you know, I, I've never heard of anything that really fits those facts. I, I think that's one of the, the, the fears that some companies have. Um, I know that was one of the concerns in, the, in OpenStack in the debate over the CLA issue, but, but I, haven't, I haven't heard about any actual um, thing like that going on. Oh yes, um, right. The, the Goldman Sachs uh, case. Yeah, um, I heard something about this recently. Um, I think just like on on the, the J Boss Asylum podcast, I'm going to say I just don't know enough about that case. So, so <laughs> I still <laughs> I still don't really know know the facts there. But but maybe the, you know, I think I think the the developer in that case argued that he had the right to use to take that code uh, because it was GPL licensed. But I think it really wasn't GPL licensed. I think that's what the the issue was. <laughs>